Kwon is someone who's credited often with designing the mini skirts and really is one of the main people that uh, is responsible for the 60s look. If you were going to a fancy dress party and you wanted to go as a 60s mod, you would be dressing in everything that Mary Kwon's invented. I think she really emancipated women. She completely transformed the way in which young women could and were dressing. Mary Kwon was a young woman. She was fashionable. She had a great haircut. Um, she was skinny and she could wear her clothes. She was an embodiment of the, the brand Mary Kwon. She not only achieved success in the 1960s, but she actually defined that decade. Mary Quant was born Barbara Mary Quant um, in February 1934 in Blackheath in London. Um, her parents were Welsh. They were actually from mining families, but both had trained to be teachers. Um, and when Mary very early on expressed an interest in fashion design as a career, they both discouraged it. Mary wound up taking a, a diploma to become an art teacher at, at Goldsmiths College in London. Um, but during the evening, she took pattern making classes because there was always an interest in fashion, always a, a, an interest in, in creating her own clothing, in, in creating, I guess, her own identity through fashion. She had an amazing time. She, she, she was completely introduced to the most amazing sort of beatnik-esque people. Um, there was a real exciting ripple going on in the 50s in London. And she was very much a central part of it. When she gained her diploma from Goldsmiths, she then went to work at a milliner's called Eric. And she said at this time she had very little money, so she didn't really eat very often, um, and it was very badly paid. But she also had begun developing her own kind of designs. It's interesting how Mary Quant's experience of 1950s London really coloured her later designs. Um, she's talked about the invention of the miniskirt as being because she thought the Chelsea girls had wonderful legs and she wanted to show them off. Um, so really it's, it's about this kind of mixing in, in different spheres of influence, mixing with different people, um, seeing this sort of new energy on the streets in London. Um, and by the, the 1950s, London and, and fashion as a whole across the world was really changing. There was this emergence in, in America and subsequently across Europe of this idea of the teenager as, as being a cultural movement in its own right. And it's really starting to influence um, popular culture and then subsequently influence fashion. And really Mary Quant is kind of absorbing all of those things. She's, she's seeing this youth being expressed across culture, across fashion, um, and, and she's kind of ripe to react to that. During her time at Goldsmiths College, Mary Quant met future husband Alexander Plunkett Green. She calls him the love of her life, you know, the one true love. And so I think without him, her life may have been very different. He bought a, a building on the King's Road um, and in the basement he opened a restaurant called Alexander's, but obviously that left the, the upstairs vacant. And what ended up happening there was, was that space was given over, over to Mary. And with the help of Alexander, with the collaboration of Alexander, she created Bazaar, which was the, the first shop. 1955 is the year that Bazaar opened on the King's Road, which is really one of the main, uh, you know, most important moments, I would say, within 20th century fashion history. She described it as um, kind of a, a bouillabaisse for the Chelsea set, this whole idea that it was a shop that you could come into and you would be able to buy dresses and shoes and, and hosiery and accessories, which at that point was still very new. People would go to specific places for, the, for these garments. You wouldn't generally go into kind of a one-stop shop and be able to, to buy everything together and have everything coordinate into a look, which was very much what Mary Quant's Bazaar was about. It was a really exciting moment in terms of her feeling a zeitgeist and really making garments for somebody or a group of people that weren't catered for at the time. And after the baby boomers had started to become 
kind of grown-ups or teenagers, there was a real kind of demand for something new, something fresh. And this is really what she was tailoring to. She was creating these pieces that people had wanted or perhaps they hadn't known they wanted it. And they were very, very inspired by kind of childlike form, cuts, silhouettes, fluid lines. She didn't know how you got cloth. And what she actually used to do was go and buy the cloth at Harrods. She would then make the clothes, hang them in bazaar, they would sell, and they would use the, the proceeds from that to go and buy more cloth, to make more clothes. So it, was, it was very much a kind of hand-to-mouth operation. It was, there was no real understanding of business, certainly no real understanding of the garment business, of, of wholesale, of manufacturing of fabrics. There was no real comprehension of, of the system of how things were done. But it, it says a lot about, about Quant, about her instincts, about her aesthetics, and about her connection to that time, that what she was doing was obviously chiming with what people actually wanted to wear. These items that she was designing were full of childlike motifs. So these kind of nursery school pinafores, aprons. So I think it was almost a sort of an interesting play on, on what it meant to be these kind of in-between age. It's not highly constructed clothes like the kind of things being offered by Paris Couturiers. Um, and it, it's, it's really focused on kind of on reality and on a total look. She's offering every element of, of the wardrobe um, for, for these young women to buy into. So the mod movement at the time was a really important subcultural sort of gang or group. And Quant very much appealed to the mod girls. She kind of catered for their look, which was very, very monochromatic, uh, very clean lines, pinafores, sharp shapes, mini skirts. A real staple of the mod look was the really doe-eyed, uh, heavily mascarad. Uh, false eyelashes. Alexander Plunkett Green had a real marketeer's mind. And I think, you know, with Mary Quant's clothing and his kind of suggestions on what they call things, and uh, for example, bras called the booby trap, uh, really kind of chimed with the brand's identity. And he was the first to put uh, the shop name on the shopping bag. So Bazaar was written in this huge font on the bag. And Quant kind of reflects upon this ingenious move because all her customers then became her walking billboards. Everybody was walking around town. And then people would stop each other in the street saying, where, where did you get that bag? I, I want what you've got. And I think it, it became almost a way of being in the gang. All these things came together. In 1962, Mary Quant signed an agreement with, with J.C. Penney, which was, in effect, licensing her name. Mary Quant affiliated garments would appear in 1,700 stores across the United States. And really what that indicated was a, an enormous shift in perceptions of Mary Quant, an enormous shift in um, the broadcast of her name, and, and it really made her name on a US stage, and therefore on a global stage. This whole idea that, that all of a sudden a, a new audience was introduced to Mary Quant. Um, and what that new audience was also introduced to w was this style that became kind of symbolic of the swing in the 60s, this style that became very much known as the London look, which are these kind of Quant staples of, of straightforward tunics, of short skirts, of um, knitwear matching, things in block colours, op art prints, stripes. All of that stuff was... was um, was sold across the United States under the Mary Quant label, so people really came to identify her with this kind of brave new world of fashion, with this, these brave new designs that were so different to what the fashion establishment were proposing. Carton Tower Hotel. When Mary Quant invades new realms of fashion, bright young girls are interested, and so is the national press. When looking at her design notes, uh, they really focus upon very geometric, sort of very graphic, uh, monochromatic stripes, uh, scalloped edges, uh, little details, but still very clean line of the actual garments. Working with Twiggy uh, was something that she did very early on. Twiggy became this, this beautiful doe-eyed, waifish kind of 
pinup of the 60s. And it was very much uh, within, within amongst the Mary Quant kind of aesthetic uh, that Twiggy kind of blossomed. I think the, the black daisy symbol that, with its five petals that, that Mary Quant invented in the 1960s, it's really emblematic of that period as a whole. It's really emblematic of this focus on very simple graphics, a kind of childlike simplicity. And that chimes with the kind of childlike simplicity of the sort of clothes that Quant was making. It's also very feminine. I think that's, that's another important thing. It's, it's as opposed to be womanly, being womanly, it's girly, but it is still feminine. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Throughout the 1960s, Mary Quant would be at the forefront of London's fashion scene. When Mary Quant starts um, to design in, in the 1960s, there's a kind of new boldness to what she's doing. In 1963, she proposes a collection called The Wet Look, which now sounds like a cliche, but then was a revolution. It took two years for her to figure out how to seem PVC, which is what the collection was made out of. And that Wet Look collection was enormously influential. You can later on see it influencing people like Yves Saint Laurent, um, who produced a, a black patent leather trench coat for Belle de Jour. But that's drawn from Mary Quant's work. Mary Quant was the first person who was working with those kind of high shine fabrics. Oh, well, the fabrics are made flat and women are round, and there's this terrible problem of putting the two together, you know, which is why I want to make round clothes uh, with no seam, so that we can be rounder and smoother than we are. At that time, uh, synthetic fabrics were really exciting generally. So a lot of the things that, you know, we now would associate with luxury, so silks or, you know, the finest wools or cashmere, actually at the time, synthetic fabrics were really new and fresh and exciting. So lots of the designers were experimenting with them. So if you look at very high-end sort of luxury clothing from the time, it's often got these kind of weird mixes um, in it. Really, Quant's innovation with, with materials was very much a mood of the time. It was that mood of, of kind of sci-fi futurism, of, of the future being something that's great, something you also see reflected in the, in the work of André Carège. Um, and then obviously in the, later in the 60s and, and, and going on, there's this enormous rivalry between Quant and Carège because they're both futurists, they both have forward-thinking visions of fashion, um, they both create incredibly kind of simple minimalist clothes and they've both laid claim to being the inventor of the miniskirt which is the defining silhouette of the 1960s. People say about her that she invented the miniskirt, which was something she's often credited with. She said, well, I didn't, my customers did. And it was a feeling of the moment. She heard reports that as girls rode the tube, men could see their knickers. So what did she do? Well, she designed the little shorties in the same fabric. So it just looked like it was all part of the one dress. And I think it was that kind of response to a lifestyle that was ever-changing at that moment in time, so fast-paced, that she really kind of listened. I don't know who you can say invented it, if you can say that uh, Quan's invented the, the miniskirt or if you can say that Koresh invented the miniskirt, because I feel like they're both working in, in two very different realms. It's entirely conceivable, I think, that Quant and Courage were both coming up with a miniskirt at the same time without any knowledge of the other person doing it. Um, and certainly when you, when you look at the way that, the, that they both use the skirt, they use it in completely different ways. Andre Courage talks about it and says that it's, it's not about the length, it was about um, allowing for movement, it was about creating volume, it was about, for him, kind of a graphic experiment. Whereas when Mary Quant talks about it, she talks about it in, in quite sort of egalitarian terms. She says the Chelsea girls had wonderful legs, the Chelsea girls were shortening her skirts, that she just wanted to take that to an extreme, to shorten the skirts because the girls look great, that she called it the mini after her favourite car. So her famous five-point bob by Vidal Sassoon, it really is uh, another historic moment, actually, and with his own separate history. Uh, Vidal Sassoon was um, 
pioneering. He was creating a totally new look alongside Quant. Quant obviously recognised this and realised it, and he talks about the first day going right up to the attic room where he was cutting hair and sitting there and watching him, and she knew she didn't have enough money, but she knew she was going to save up for that bob. His haircut for her became something that was emulated by dozens of women. It was something that Mary Quant herself had all of her models cut by Vidal before she took them on a, a tour of America. That haircut, along with those clothes, came to be this kind of physical embodiment of everything that was happening in London at that period in time. And when Mary took her clothes um, and those models to America, it was really about exporting that idea of swinging London. And that was something that uh, America kind of went crazy for. It's the first time she sort of staged this catwalk show where she had models running, jumping, dancing down the catwalk. Now, this was extraordinary and so her kind of music explosion dancing celebration was completely new these weren't supposed to be danced in these clothes in that nature and I think it kind of spoke to the people she was designing for this ladies and gentlemen is London swinging London it's been called Time London did an article on what they called swinging London and it was sort of a, it was an illustrated map of the King's Road, mapping out all the different parts that they felt important. And I think there's a real coming together synergy, of so many different aspects that kind of put everything into an explosion that is now known as the swinging 60s. And I think Mary Quant's part in that is huge. There's this whole idea that, that what Quant was doing at that point in time was really epitomising what was going on in London in the 1960s. And what was happening in London in the 1960s was determining what was happening in the rest of the world. It was really the place that everybody was looking to. So having people like um, Twiggy and Jean Shrimpton as these kind of young incarnations of her woman as, as this you know um, Twiggy at that point was was only a teenager but the whole idea that, that these teenagers were wearing her clothes in the same way that she helped other teenagers would be buying into clothes um, they were incredibly important as kind of embodiments of her work as embodiments of the sort of youthfulness that she represented I think Quant's clothing signified so much of what was important at that time. If you were going to a fancy dress party and you wanted to go as a 60s mod, you would be dressing in everything that Mary Quant invented. By the mid-1960s, Mary Quant's name is, is known incredibly widely across the United Kingdom, across the United States, really across the world. And she's able to capitalise on that. She's designing all different lines. She's designing underwear. Um, she was designing patterns with butterick that were selling 70,000 copies at their first printing. She's designing furs. She's really designing a huge range of, of, of products. At this point in the mid-1960s is also when she launches Colour by Quant, she launches her makeup line. Um, and really what, what that does is, is kind of give the Mary Quant stamp to cosmetics. I think the cosmetics line is a fascinating part of her business because it's something she did so early on and it was again responding to things she couldn't get. It's extraordinary for a young designer like, like Mary Quant to be proposing a cosmetics line at this point in time, but, but what it does do is completely speak to her audience, completely speak to the, the, the consumers of Mary Quant, who increasingly want bold colour that, that traditional cosmetics lines don't allow. <laughs> I think it's quite amazing to think that Mary Quant got an OBE aged 32 in 1966. I wouldn't say it's unbelievable because certainly it's well deserved. It's, you know, absolutely she deserves it for, for services to fashion. I would say in 1966, Mary Quant wasn't just a fashion designer, she was the fashion designer in London. Towards the end of the 60s, Mary Quant continued to push the fashion boundaries and raising some eyebrows in the process when she began designing hot pants. Was the world ready for hot pants? No, not really. Not in the late 60s. And I think that she, again, was kind of feeling a new kind of move. And if you look at the 70s as a decade, what are the standout fashionable items? Hot pants are so there, uh, along with other flares, etc. And I think her kind of feeling that out at the late 60s kind of moves things on. Uh, immediately. It's kind of indicative of, of 
quant approach, the fact that she's always pushing it, she's always trying to push it further, make things shorter, make, make things more provocative. She's very much a, a kind of a product of her times, which is that idea of kind of risk-taking, of experimentation. Obviously, the Mary Quant name still has traction, the Mary Quant name still has a, a certain value. It's quite interesting that Mary Quant's name was, was bought in 2000 after a, a decade obsessed with revivals of the 1960s, which saw a, a, a huge increase in interest in the Mary Quant name. All different kinds of fashion houses, from kind of Moschino through to Versace, proposing 1960s-inspired looks in the 90s, um, which, which bore the imprint of Mary Quant style. In 2000, a Japanese company bought the Mary Quant trademark from her. I think really it's, it's indicative of her skill, the fact that, that the company was still going, the company was still um, available to be purchased at that point. I, I think because Quant's clothes were always so focused on kind of freedom, on ease of movement, they do still have a contemporary appeal. They, do, they can still be worn by women. And you don't necessarily feel like you're wearing a costume in the way that you would, for instance, if you were wearing a 1940s dress by Christian Dior, um, which are constructed in such a different way to, to contemporary clothes. The idea that Quant was removing linings, removing interfacing, removing structure from garments really chimes with the way that clothes are made to date. It's this idea of modern clothing. And, and that's really what her clothes in the 1960s represented. Then they seemed really brave, futuristic and new. And now looking at them, we can see them as forward looking because they still chime with the clothes that people want to wear today. Mary Quant at the moment is living in, in retirement. She's still living in London, and she was made a Dame of the British Empire for services to fashion in 2015. I think it's difficult to argue that she didn't deserve that, because really if we're talking about London fashion, London fashion emerged as a global force in the 1960s. That was when London was put on the map as a fashion capital, and that was down to Mary Quant. They seek him here. They seek him there. London in the 1960s was the centre of the fashion world. It was really the place that was setting the trends and was challenging the world and was influencing what other designers were doing. That's entirely down to what Mary Quant was doing. Come the boutiques of London town. She has had such an impact on the way in which women can express themselves through clothing. Uh, she created a way in which young or youth or the first kind of youth garments uh, were developed by her by seeing that there was something missing there. She really felt for the time and I think the legacy really is all kind of sewn up in what it now means to be a woman. One week he's in polka dots, and next week he's in stripes, cos he's a dedicated follower of fashion. The best way to summarise Mary Quant is that she invented London fashion. In Regent Street and Leicester Square, everywhere the Carnivation army marches on each one and